Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is David Freeman. I'm the editorial director of NBC News Mock, which is M-A-C-H. Uh, I'm also today's moderator, and I'll introduce our panelists right away, starting uh, to my immediate right, Walter Willett, professor of epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, Gina McCarthy, professor of the practice of public health in the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard Chan School, and also the 13th administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. David Bennell, the manager of food, land, and water, and member relations at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and Anna Sorton, chef and owner of the restaurant Oleana here in Cambridge, and a winner of the James Beard Award. This event is being presented jointly with NBC News Digital. We're streaming live on the websites of the forum and NBC News Mock. We're also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, this program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to uh, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. Um, so uh, with a total population of about seven and a half billion today, uh, the world is already pretty crowded and the global population is expected to reach 10 billion by 2050. How can we feed that many people? How can we do that while protecting human health and the health of the planet? Uh, one thing's for sure, I think the panels here would agree, uh, we can't do what we've been doing because current patterns of food production and consumption uh, aren't good for our bodies or for the planet. Uh, earlier this year, the, the Eat Lancet Commission introduced a planetary health diet that offers possible solutions. And Walter, you're a part of that, or you co-authored the report. Can you please tell us what it is and take us through it? Sure. Uh, the challenge put to this commission was to feed the world a diet that is healthy and sustainable and by 2050 will reach close to 10 billion people. And as you said, we're currently far off track from arriving at that, uh, at that goal. Therefore, the commission really faced a, a tremendous uh, challenge. Uh, in fact, uh, just to paint a quick picture, if we look at the nutritional status of the world, uh, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, we have uh, still about 800 million people who are undernourished. We have about 2 billion people who are overweight or obese, and that number is increasing uh, rapidly uh, all around the world. And most of the rest of the world is eating a diet that's far from optimal. And uh, to make it more complicated, as you also noticed, the way we produce our food and the way we produce what we're eating today is degrading the planet and really undermining the resources that are critical to feed the future population of the world. Uh, and then we are adding close to two, two and a half billion people mm -hmm. by, uh, by uh, 2050. That's a pretty daunting challenge given that to arrive at a sustainable and healthy diet for everyone. Uh, so to get at this issue, we uh, broke the process down into several steps. The first was to using the best available, available evidence from all around the world to define what is a healthy diet. Uh, and I can't go into all of the details of that, but if I could have a slide up. Uh, uh, basically, what we realized that, uh, putting all the evidence together, was that there's quite a bit of flexibility. Uh, and this allows a lot of diversity of uh, diets from different cultures, uh, different agricultural systems. But uh, primarily, this will mean a substantial shift from what we're doing today to a diet that is largely plant-based, but still has some meat, some dairy, uh, fish in it. Uh, and uh, plenty of uh, healthy, source, healthy foods in the diet, uh, more nuts, more 
uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, legumes, and the, the amount of fish would increase uh, if, given from what we are doing today. Uh, very briefly, this slide shows uh, the major food groups and uh, the vertical line toward the left of that figure uh, is uh, essentially the target numbers that we came up with to define an optimally healthy diet. And uh, the, then the various bars uh, indicate what different regions of the world are eating today. And as you can see, we're uh, in general quite a bit over the target numbers for red meat, but that's very different for different countries. Southeast Asia, for example, is below the target numbers, so there's a lot of variability. Uh, but toward the bottom, we see, again, the, the healthy foods, fruits, nuts, legumes, uh, soy products, uh, nuts, uh, where we would be better off with substantial increases. We used several different uh, approaches to evaluate the healthfulness of this diet, and they all converged to suggest that if we did, as our, our world, move to this, these dietary targets, we would prevent about 11 million premature deaths per year, mm -hmm. which is about 20 to 25 percent of the total deaths per year. So there's a huge health benefit of adopting this healthy diet. Uh, we then, as a second step, went on to look at whether we could possibly produce this diet within the planetary boundaries. We can't infinitely produce more greenhouse gas, use unlimited amounts of water. There are our planetary boundaries that were, uh, uh, have been defined by other research groups. Uh, and the good news is, when we went through all of this, that it is possible to feed the world a healthy and sustainable diet by 2050, but it will require major changes in what we eat and how we produce our food. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of that, you mentioned the, uh, the role of environmental change and global warming and so on. That's going to be a big thing that we'll talk about in a bit. But let's watch a brief clip at this point that shows how climate change has been affecting the food that we, uh, affecting our planet. Uh, this clip refers to the years 2000 through 2009. And of course, the four hottest years of record have occurred since then in 2015, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, in a warming planet, it really does have a big impact on our systems, our food systems. The video is courtesy of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Let's take a look at that. All of the events of the past decade, all of our memories, have something in common. They all took place during the hottest decade ever recorded since humans began keeping temperature records about 150 years ago. In the last decade, the Earth's temperature rose roughly a third of a degree Fahrenheit. Since 1880, it's risen about one and a half degrees. You might say the Earth's running a fever, and scientists predict it's going to get much worse. Already, we can tally the signs. Global sea level rose by over an inch during the decade, almost twice as fast as the average during the 20th century. Arctic summer sea ice declined by over 300,000 square miles, enough ice to cover the states of Texas and Kentucky. The vast majority of climate scientists say evidence for human-caused warming is clear. But less understood is exactly how this warming will change the complex interactions between our planet's land, water, sky, and the living organisms that inhabit our world. So, um, Gina, you're kind of, as a former EPA administrator, you're kind of in a good position to talk about the, uh, the relationship between climate and food. So if you would fill us in. Well, let me just start by thanking Walter for doing this report and all the other researchers. It's remarkable that it's the first time we've really ever looked at at what is a healthy diet and what are the foods we need and what does it mean for the planet. Um, it's great to be healthy individually. I'd like to still stick, make sure people are on the planet as well, uh, which, which seems to be a, a key issue. Um, and, and I think really that's what, it, what it's all about. We have to look, as Walter said, at, at how we produce our food. You know, it's not just about what kinds of food, but how we produce it. And when you talk about what kinds of food, we have to recognize that, you know, food is really culturally and in many cases religiously embedded in how people think about their lives. This is a big shift that needs to begin or should have begun a long time ago in how we look at food and how we get 
people to to uh, uh, demand food that's both healthy for them and meets their cultural and religious needs. And then secondly, you have to look at how you produce that food. You know, right now we have industrial agriculture factory farming that we know is degrading our environment. And we also know you have to think about the future under a changing climate with droughts and, and intense floods. And how do we change the way we think about growing food to make sure that, that it retains the carbon, that you have rich soil, that you don't rely on fossil fuel fertilizers and pesticides, that you shift to organically based farming and you think about the best way you can to actually uh, keep farms local to the extent that you can because the third issue is how do you manage food? Because we waste 40% of the food between the farm and the table. And then we have to think about how do we get people engaged in this? We want them to demand healthy food, but we also want them to have a, a rich a sense that, uh, of where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I want them to be engaged in the food process. And I want to think about how we eliminate that waste by engaging them. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about what happens from the farm to a manufacturing or a production shop. It is about what happens in your own fridge. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the best things you can do to stop wasting food is shop your fridge. <laughs> you know, understand what food labels mean. Don't throw it out before you need to, but don't let it hang in the back for a long time. These are small things, but they engage people in the solutions. And where food is concerned, it's, it's personal, and we need people to demand agriculture that is respectful of the environment, that understands that we're already in a changed environment, that takes a look at what's happening in Nebraska and Iowa and other places where farms are now destroyed and flooded out. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out how to do this better, keep our forests intact, keep our ecosystems functioning, and figure out how we feed these uh, 10 million people. I have no doubt that we can do it. The real question is how do we engage enough people to make the demands and make their shifts in behavior so that this is what we deliver to the world. And that's the challenge. And really climate change is the biggest public health challenge that we face today, mm -hmm. as is our nutrition. We have to blend them together and think systemically how to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Well, David, you work with the companies that are trying to make some of these sorts of changes that Gina's talking about. Tell us about your role, your organization, and what uh, businesses see as the big obstacles and opportunities, if there are opportunities as well. I'd be happy to. First of all, I want to say thank you to the School of Public Health for inviting me and us here, Lillian, particularly you and Walter. And a special thank you to the students in the room and online, because I know it's break time and there are many, many other things <laughs> you could be doing. But I really appreciate that you're here and online and with us, because we need you. Can you cue the first slide, please? The World Business Council for Sustainable Development is a Geneva, Switzerland-based organization where in other places around the world, 200 multinational companies and CEO-led. We have about 60 network partners around the world, too. And of those 200 companies, about 80 are involved in the food and ag space. And they're, they're ones that you would think of, um, but there are also companies like Google and Microsoft and some, what, some of the really interesting ones that I may touch on in a little bit. Um, we've got six primarily, primary uh, areas of focus. There are six economic drivers we believe we can most influence. You can see them there on your screen. Circular economy, cities and mobili mobility, climate and energy. I'll skip over food and nature. That's where I work, and I'll come back to that one. Uh, people, we have a really interesting new program called the Future of Work. Let's feed a, billion of, a planet of 10 billion people, but we should probably employ them too, everyone not just people that look like me. And then back to um, and redefining value, which is a fascinating one. Our CEO likes to say that accountants will save the world. And I think he might be right. I mean, we really need to get financial markets and capital markets to reward the sorts of things that I think many of us in this room and online believe in, in our financial disclosure and reporting. So we're working hard to try and make that happen through working with the capital markets and uh, the securities and other agencies that reward them. Food and Nature, you see there is the program I work in. About 80 different companies involved in this space. And um, we try and work through this lens of the sustainable development goals. They were referenced uh, just a couple of minutes ago, so go ahead and tee up that next slide for me. If you haven't heard of the sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them. This cool pin of mine 
<laughs> is sort of the graphic representation of it. So if you've ever seen anybody with this on, you can say, oh, the SDGs. <laughs> and if you think about it, it really <laughs> is oh, the what? The what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the SDGs. They are, in 2015, basically the world, 193 companies, the UN General Assembly agreed on a path forward. You can call it a roadmap. If you want to be more politically correct, maybe it's a bike path. <laughs> but it is an agreed upon path forward for how to do this thing that we call the Earth sustainably. The goals are set to be achieved by 2030. That's a stretch, but what are we if we're not ambitious? And the slide up here is one that we use specifically to focus on sort of the farm and ag space. 17 different sustainable development goals, 169 targets, and 232 indicators backing up the targets. But here's an example of when we work with our companies looking at how do we achieve the sustainable development goals, they oftentimes need to focus and should focus on those SDGs that are most applicable to the business. And then next slide, please. I've been asked to focus on technology, which we'll do in the second half. Here's a cool one. This is called the Coco Cloud. This is a project you'll see with some of our member companies and partners we're running in Ghana and the Ivory Coast using data-enabled climate solutions through mobile phones and other really interesting applications to help, we hope, up to one million smallholder farmers uh, make better farming decisions based on better ability to forecast and plan for weather. And as Gina has just said, you can't forecast for what's happening in the Midwest right now. Um, but to the extent we can help farmers better use data to plan their work, um, we believe we can contribute to the sustainable development goals and, as are more importantly, to the livelihoods of those farmers. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, um, and Gina, and I guess everyone has mentioned to some extent, the, uh, one of the big challenges here is getting everyone to change eating habits. Um, and the key here is, is to make food that is as uh, tasty as it is healthful and sustainable. And Anna, mm -hmm. um, you're um, uh, well known for your Mediterranean cuisine. Um, and so you're part of the, the work on that delicious part of the equation. Um, so what do you see as the biggest challenges to bringing this planetary health diet um, that Walter was talking about to people's plates? And how can cooks at home and in restaurants uh, help that? Uh, yeah, I think um, it's, first of all, it's an honor to be with all of you. You guys are changing the world as we speak and it's, um, it's pretty fabulous, but I think We've all touched upon it, and um, it really, uh, to me, it comes down to good ingredients. Um, you know, it can be, in general, hard to find really good quality um, food that's fresh, and it's also got some, some health benefit to it as well, especially when it's on a, a bigger commercial scale. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, it's, it's easier said than done. How do we buy less, you know, commercially? produced industrialized food? How do we try to keep it more local um, and use smaller suppliers? Um, especially like when we're in the airport or you know we're traveling or whatever, there's just, it's just so hard to do it on a constant basis. But um, there isn't enough access to uh, really good fresh um, food and I think there, there could be more. And I think um, from a chef's point of view, I mean, fresh equals flavor, and, and I'm one, I can't even imagine, it's, it's all I really think about is flavor. I can't even imagine not liking vegetables, so I think, um, <laughs> I, think it's, uh, I think it's also a little bit of a, a spin. It's, it's really just sort of understanding a little bit more about, um, you know, how to find the, that flavor, uh, where to get it, um, sh far shopping farmer's markets, and um, and it gets into sort of an economical thing now, but I think there's so much change as far as uh, that is concerned and a lot more access to uh, locally grown vegetables uh, for everyone. Um, and then it's also in the kitchen, it's like, okay, how do I achieve more flavor when I'm cooking with a without adding the cheap tricks? And we all know what the cheap tricks are. It's, um, it's fat, it's sugar, it's salt, it's high fructose corn syrup, it's all that stuff. Um, and so you kind of have to be creative, but not at the same time. There's some, some really cool natural high fructose corn syrup, like onions can be really amazing. Just adding, you know, onions to your cooking um, and using a lot of them can, can transform things. You know, and for me, I've always been really um, focused on the use of spice and how to use spice in, in a Mediterranean way. And for me, 
that's where the flavor, the depth, the richness comes from, and then nothing becomes heavy. So in other words, you can you can eat and you can eat quite quite a bit of vegetables without having it being uh, without feeling really bad. Um, so you, you know, finding <laughs> flavors like umami. <laughs> Um, umami is another one too. There's a lot of umami um, just right under your finger trip, under your fingertips. So it's it's kind of reinvigorating your pantries. Finding using a little tomato paste here and there, which is umami. Soy sauce is sort of an, um, a well a better known umami. A little bit of Parmesan cheese goes a long ways. Um, so it's really on how to change the tools that you have and the way you think about what tastes good. I mean, a donut tastes good, but so does broccoli if you cook it with some of these <laughs> tricks. It really, really does. Um, and I know that's like a really sad comparison, but it's, it's, the, opposite, <laughs> it's the opposite swing of the pendulum, right? Um, and I think most of all, I mean, this is like one of my, famous, my favorite quotes because I'm, I'm married to an organic vegetable farmer. But Michael Pollan says that that the more we, the deeper the connection we have with the person that grows or makes our food, it tastes better, right? And then it's also it is about the soil. It the soil is really a big difference when it comes to flavor. A tomato tastes so different when it's grown in soil, really rich soil versus sand. So I mean, there really is a difference, and sort of being able to um, figure that out is 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 the fun part. It's kind of an adventure. So, um, yeah, would would all organic be ideal? Sure. I don't think pesticides are doing any of us any good, but I think uh, it's a tricky, um, I think we, we want to empower ourselves to be a little bit more creative to, to get through some of these challenges too. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about the, the donut versus broccoli, <laughs> but I guess we can move ahead. So uh, now we're going to shift a bit, uh, not to lunch, unfortunately, but um, to uh, talking about solutions. Uh, but before, before we do, let's watch a clip from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, it shows some of these solutions in action and particularly how new technologies are helping make uh, farming more sustainable. So, David, you work with companies, uh, businesses that try to make farming more efficient. Tell us about how that works. Well, first of all, I want to talk about the image of cops in broccoli shops instead <laughs> of donut shops. I think that then we'll, that would be, we, I think we've had it solved now, um, if we can move to that. <coughs> how about that image? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I had, I had nothing to do with that, vi that beautiful video, so I can't take credit for that, but it does tee up sort of this great sort of conversation about how are we going to do this? And again, because I've been asked to focus on technology, I'm going to give three different examples. Um, one I referenced earlier is this idea we call the cocoa cloud. Um, you may not know this, but it's Climate Week in Africa this week, and we actually launched this thing um, at Climate Week. And cocoa cloud is a pretty straightforward premise that, as you know, many people around the world um, carry mobile phones, and it's all of us who get to live in places like we're living now and watching this from, um, but it also includes many farmers in Ghana and the Ivory Coast. And so the idea is, could we create a, a mechanism that would enable through the mobile phone network to enable these farmers to make better predictions about weather and make better predictions about when to plant, um, when to harvest, et cetera. So using the mobile phone network and a series of satellites and a series of really interesting partnerships against very interesting 
bedfellows or bed people. Um, we're trying to work this through. And the, the application of the Cocoa Cloud, if we get it right, I, I referenced it in the opening comments, and it could impact one million small, smallholder holder farmers in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in, in the Ivory Coast. So, you know, if we get that right there, the implications and applications are really interesting for other places and spaces. So how do we sort of normalize technology that's available and we use every day? Um, it's okay if some of you are texting right now. Um, you know, we're using as we speak um, to really make some very logical um, and obvious sort of solutions available in the field. There's a great quote that goes something like, look, unpredictable weather makes for an unpredictable harvest. Just ask anyone who's trying to deal with the deluge in the Midwest or, or drought in other places. So trying to really make this um, available and, and affordable and also contribute to the equity that doesn't exist, um, not in those two countries exclusively, but everywhere. So let's make this normal for everyone. There's another one um, called Loop. Um, imagine Hagen dazs being delivered to your house like in the olden days when you had a milkman. I'm sorry to use that <coughs> pronoun, but milk person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still have that. I live in Maine, and there are still milk people that will come once in a while. So there actually is this really interesting, I'll call it a test of a number of different companies across the value chain, where you can order certain kinds of consumables that will be delivered to your door, door by UPS in containers in a tote that you then eat and you you then get online and you send it back and it comes back whenever you're ready with more haagen or more or more dove or more so really i mean it's happening now as we speak if you think about sort of these old models that are not so crazy um, how do we bring them into the 21st century using the technologies that we have and then the other one um, is something really interesting. I, full disclosure, started my career at Microsoft, and, and so I'm going to mention a project from them because I know the company well. It's called Farm <coughs> Beat. It's called Farm Beats. Farm Beats, it, have you ever turned on your television? I know some of us on this panel uh, do know what I'm talking about. You turn on the television, and there's a channel, and it's just white space. Well, those white spaces exist all over the place, including on farms. That sort of television space is available and, and underutilized. So there's a project that Microsoft is leading through their AI for Earth, Artificial Intelligence for Earth project, around the Internet of Things to try and capture that white space and use it on farm. And so you can imagine a drone if you can afford it, but a helium balloon if you can't, that takes a mobile phone up, gets a view of the farm, sends the data up into the cloud, and gets it right back to you very quickly with real-time data that you can use to look at your field. What's overwatered? What's underwatered? Mm -hmm. Where are the pests? Where aren't the pests? And that's being tested right now by Microsoft in places like Carnation, Washington, and in other places. So really interesting sort of things that some of our member companies are doing and others that our non-members are doing, and I just thought I'd tee some of those up. Yeah, interesting. So, um, and Gina, you know, we're, we're talking about this kind of high technology, but also what can you tell us about the way, better ways to use the agricultural land that we do? What's, what, what are some things that we need to do with the land? Well, uh, uh, let me begin by saying, uh, Annie, you might think that um, we are out to change the world, but you rock my world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, your, your food experience is quite amazing. So thank your husband. I had no idea he was part of it. Um, you know, p part of the, the, the challenge that we face is that um, agriculture today, at least the way the majority of it is practiced, it can be considerably damaging to the environment. I mean, we see it. We see the harmful algal blooms that are just about everywhere across the United States. Most notably, we saw it in Toledo, where they had cyanotoxins created by harmful algal blooms what, that were really a result of runoff that went into Western Lake Erie and where the water gets warmer and climate change, those things happen. And we have to think about keeping soil in its place. So every time you till for farming, you have the challenge of, of increasing carbon emissions and you have the challenge of runoff that right now, in the, even in the United States, 55% of the river and stream miles are actually too heavily contaminated with nutrients from runoff to be able to have healthy ecosystems. So for many reasons, we need to change the way we think about it. We need to store the carbon in the soil. Soil is everything. 
I think people have always known this. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that with the uh, exacerbated storms that we're seeing with the changing climate is you have to plan for runoff. You have to think about how you use no-till farming where you can. You have to think about how you use the kind of technologies you're talking about to be able to understand where water needs to be used and where it's wasted. Because water is going to compete between drinking water and feeding people. That's a competition we don't want to either side to lose. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways in which we have to think about feeding more people, but making our ability to produce that an opportunity to reduce the current impacts and an opportunity to reduce the methane and greenhouse gases that are being emitted without eliminating the best foods that are available and nutritious for us. And I think it's a challenge, but I think by no means is it an insurmountable one. We have regenerative agriculture that is all about policies and practices that do exactly this, that use natural systems, ecosystems, biodiversity, instead of looking at dead end use of chemicals where they have nowhere to go but in our food or in our water. And so there are ways in which this is already being explored and successfully in so many places. The issue is how do we scale that up? How do we spread the word? How do we make change the, the equation for agriculture to shift from being a carbon emitter to being a carbon sink, which could make them opportunities for significant resources as we start really valuing carbon emissions and put a price on carbon the way I think every Everybody knows and expects will happen. So there's opportunities for agriculture to do what they do best, which is to protect the land and produce our food and do it in a way that makes them more economically viable at the same time. And that's the win that we have to go for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's shift a bit from production <coughs> to consumption. So as you're a nutrition expert uh, um, as well as being part of this commission. So what does the uh, Eat Lancet Commission say about what we should eat for health? Yeah. Well, we did spend a lot of time on defining a, a healthy diet. I don't have time to uh, hmm. discuss the really hundreds of thousands Donuts of papers. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah, and uh, we did it in courage nuts, but not donuts. So, again, very broadly, without going into all of the numbers, uh, we did uh, suggest more limited amounts of animal source protein, uh, especially red meat, because it is such, it is the uh, huge emitter of greenhouse gases for all the time it's living and, uh, and breathing. Uh, plus, uh, uh, in general, feeding grain to cattle in particular is hugely inefficient, uh, depending on how you measure it, uh, roughly a 20 to 1 conversion of what we feed uh, uh, cattle to uh, uh, convert it to edible food for humans, uh, massively inefficient. And of course, the production of all that grain and soy that we feed to them has the kind of environmental footprints yeah. that uh, Gina is, is talking about. Uh, so uh, in the end, uh, we uh, w uh, came up with some numbers for, say, red meat, which might be low by what American expectations are. It's about uh, 14 grams a day with uh, some flexibility around that. Uh, and that amounts to about one hamburger per week or uh, a, a, a big steak once a month. And some people would think that's small, but actually the amount of uh, poultry plus red meat that we suggest in terms of target numbers is uh, a bit more than what was consumed in the traditional Mediterranean diet uh, when it was uh, really traditional before the industrialization of it back in the 1950s and 1960s. And at that time, people had the longest life expectancy in the world were uh, those men consuming the Mediterranean uh, diet at that time. Uh, now, uh, this is partly how we think of food. Uh, red meat in the Mediterranean diet is something special. Uh, we might have small amounts in a mixed dish or uh, as a celebratory event. And in fact, uh, it's, it's really about, uh, we have to shift our thinking into something like I consider lobster, uh, which uh, hopefully the main people will <laughs> appreciate, uh, that I really like it. Uh, yeah, but it's not something I eat every day. It's a, a special event. Um, and uh, th that's sort of how we, I think, need to shift toward thinking about some of the foods we have in our diet. Uh, we have, fortunately, lots of traditional diets from around the world that are uh, healthy and sustainable. And the best studied one is the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and 
Uh, we've learned a lot uh, using that as an example in terms of analysis. And uh, uh, one of the good things about all of this is that uh, we have a double win situation. We can improve our health and improve the environmental, in, environmental impact, in fact, to make it sustainable in the long run uh, by adopting this more, uh, what some people call a flexitarian diet. It's not a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, but one that emphasizes plant sources of protein. So uh, better health, better environment, and as Anna has really shown and the chefs across the country have really shown too, it can be a triple win with being uh, marvelously uh, enjoyable and tasty. To accomplish this, we've worked a lot with the culinary world, in particular our partners at the Culinary Institute of America, uh, bringing together the major food services around the country, having uh, 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 chefs uh, really demonstrate and show how to put this into practice. But uh, as uh, some have mentioned, uh, really starting at home is important. We worked right here at Harvard Dining Service, uh, with Harvard Dining Service, and uh, we've had good partners there. We have really changed our food service in a way uh, that uh, emphasizes the kind of uh, dietary balance that we're talking about. And uh, it actually our food service is a destination place uh, mm -hmm. now that people come from around the medical area to uh, enjoy the food that we have here. It's not just healthy uh, it's, uh, and sustainable, it's, it's enjoyable. Some of this has been uh, behind the scenes. For example, we worked before it was uh, widespread to eliminate trans fat here. So we improved the diet that way. We reduced the amount of sodium carefully and stepwise so nobody noticed. But uh, even without uh, paying attention to it, people are eating a much healthier diet here. But we've also, we have a great salad bar. We have creative uh, uh, veg use of vegetables and fish. We have a connection with a local fisherman. We, we eat here what's caught. We, uh, it's not that we're ordering 10 pounds of salmon every day or something like that. Uh, and in fact, I think the fish are fresher here at our food service than uh, any uh, of the major restaurants around town because we, we get it directly, whatever's caught uh, that, that day. So there's a lot we have to, uh, many people we have to work with, uh, as Gina pointed out, the agricultural system, but uh, also the food service system uh, uh, to make healthy and sustainable eating uh, enjoyable for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we, we talked. You talked about the Mediterranean diet a lot in, in just now, and and on your that's your world. So, and you talked a bit about things that you can do with the onions and so on. Any other specific kind of guidance quickly about what mm -hmm. people can do to incorporate this kind of diet in their in their lives? Olive oil is a great trick, by the way. It's a good healthy fat that if you are using a great olive oil, it. it um, it's an incredible, it, it adds an incredible dimension to it. And I think we have to think of our cooking as dimensional. It's not just like uh, this way, it's more round. So you really want to think about how to maximize uh, flavor. And oftentimes even a, a, veg a vegetable dish can be um, flavored with meat. So using broths and, and using, in other words, not, you know, using the meat wisely. So if you're going to have that less meat in your diet, just using it to actually flavor things which can um, um, do extraordinary things. But again, for me, the longest time I had cooked um, for what I thought was Mediterranean uh, cuisine, sort of focused on the central part of it. And then I was invited to Turkey and went a little Eastern in the Mediterranean. And that's where I saw the really exciting stuff where I almost couldn't sit down. It was so exciting. And tasting things I'd what is this? It's so rich. It has so much flavor. And then realizing that I tasted 30 things for lunch, and that's um, pretty impossible to do without feeling, without feeling bad. Um, and so I realized after kind of studying this food that the richness and the depth comes from the spices. And they're not using the spices in a heavy way, but they're using them to add those dimensions that I was talking about earlier which often can be found in a glass of wine throughout the rest of the uh, western part of the Mediterranean. Okay. Um, one other thing too, you, um, Dave, you talked about the SDGs with your cool pen and all that, so let's go back to that for a second. Um, and one, one aspect of climate change, I guess a particularly ominous one, is that it increases or kind of uh, widens the gap between rich and poor. So I wonder if you can talk us, uh, tell us about how the UN is trying to um, you know, using the SDGs to uh, prevent that from happening, but getting any worse. Well, first of all, I live in Maine, so thanks for the shout out to Maine <laughs> Lobster, Walter. Um, we appreciate it. 
Um, I mean, WBCSD looks at everything we do through the Sustainable Development Goals. So if you have not ever heard of them, um, that's okay. You're, you're normal. Um, but it really is a powerful sort of, it's a license to operate, to operate on this earth. So take a look at it. Um, SD, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, is where I've spent a good portion of this week um, working in Washington, D.C. Um, so if you look at SDG 2 on Zero Hunger and you start to look at the targets and the initiatives, you'll find it really drills down to things like gender and like climate change and like sustainable consumption and production. Gina very rightly mentioned the huge amount of food loss and waste. If food loss and waste were a country, it would be about the third or fourth largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So, I mean, there's so much wrapped up just in the idea of zero hunger. We have a program called FRESH, um, which Walter knows well, Food Reform for Sustainability and Health. And one of the work streams in there early on was focused on uh, nutrition insecurity. Some of the most nutrition insecure people in the world, paradoxically and sadly, are farmers. Mm. And you start to drill down into that and you look at who's the most nutrition insecure on the farm, it's women and children. So. I don't have brilliant answers for you um, on how to do this, but if you look at SDG2 and even Google the SDG2 hub, you'll start to find some really interesting work by amazing people like Honest Cohort Group, the Chef's Manifesto, that are starting to try and put this whole thing together and trying to figure out how do we challenge this. And the answer is it's through systems and through systems transformation. And some of you, all of you can't see this, but there's a person sitting in the front row here that has an amazing patch on her coat and it says break the routine. Mm -hmm. I think part of this is, yeah, we have to break. We got to break the routine. Um, I wonder if we can. <laughs> I knew it meant something. I didn't know what it meant. You have seven cameras <laughs> pointing, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> yeah, another thing that uh, I want to talk about, G Gina kind of referenced this earlier about the idea of food waste. and. Uh, you know, what are some of the things that we might do to prevent food waste, as you said, is a huge com uh, you know, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and yeah. as well as economic problems? Well, it, it's just like anything else. Waste comes at every step of the process. So part of it is keeping food locally. Part of it is making sure that food is properly refrigerated. New technologies are, are helping that happen so that you can get uh, food away from the farm and, and into the into uh, our uh, homes and schools and supermarkets and everything. But part of it is, you know, you just have to look at wherever you are. We talked about the home, but talk about schools. You mentioned this, Walter. One of the things that the Office of Sustainability here has not just done working with the faculty like Walter and the students to improve the quality of the food and the nutritional value, but they also develop sustainability and healthful food standards that look at where it's coming from and how I, I look at the full life cycle of, of the school. And, and it's available online for other schools that want to look at it. It's at green.harvard.edu slash food. You know, it's, it's a way to just tell the students what the, what the impact of this food is so they can choose wisely. You know, the more information we have, the more transparent, the more you can make good choices, and that's important. But when I was at uh, EPA, we worked a lot with the James Beard Society. You know, I went to a lot of their conferences, mainly because they had great food at them, <laughs> but, but mostly because we talked about these issues to get people involved and engaged, to talk about food deserts and where they are. Cities now can manage those issues. They can demand that supermarkets go in places where people need the most. One of the most heartbreaking issues I had to deal with at, at EPA was the, the lead in the water in Flint, Michigan. When I went there, every street corner had nothing but a, a, a a small little, you know, five and dime store, you know, a little store where you could buy cigarettes and a place where you could buy liquor. I couldn't find a supermarket. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, the city now has in its midst a really nice sort of uh, a farmer's market, but we have to address these inequity issues. There's no question about it. And we can do that. We can demand more of businesses. We can work in our, our schools to make sure that one of the things I do is talk at a lot of colleges. What, I, what schools have figured out is if you don't put trays out, people don't throw food away. Because trays just allow you to pile stuff on that you're never going to eat, but it looks good at the time. Sort of how we always act. Take the food away, the trays away, 
of the waste goes away. There's tricks to dealing with human beings because we're all kind of quirky, right? <laughs> and then the, the other thing we do is work with supermarkets, first of all, in how they purchase their food. They overbought often food that was, was going to be perishable. And then when the food didn't look spiffy pretty, right. They'd toss it away instead of sharing it and sending it to, to other places like food pantries or soup kitchens that can really make something of this food. So there's ways in which we can think creatively about this and not make everything so hard instead of integrate it into our lives in an everyday way. It is only when you really start to do that that you get the breadth and depth of actions that are essential for our future and our, and our kids' health. And, but when you do that, it becomes ingrained in your own values and your own behavior, and it, and it matters. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, I want to make sure I don't leave oceans out because we talk about soil a lot, not particularly as relevant there, you know, but there is s significant challenge with our oceans today. We now know that our fisheries are being depleted, not just because of coral bleaching, but because of the salinity change in the, in the, in the, in the uh, oceans. And a lot of it has to do with the ancillary issues related to our lives, like plastics that are ending in, up in, in our bodies, in our blood, in our food, the microbeads that happen. We have to think more systemically about these issues. We cannot allow the, the sort of things we use around our food to actually end up in our bodies. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done in that area as well. And I think it's part and parcel of the discussion we're having. Okay, well, we're running a bit late, so let's go to questions right away. and. Uh, one that um, came out, actually, I think before we got, came out here, uh, uh, Walter, you and Dave were talking about eating crickets or something. So uh, someone is asking, would insects be a good protein source? I guess yes, but what role will cr crickets play in the, in the world? Uh, the yeah, world's uh, it certainly is a hot topic now, and we need to learn more about it. Uh, many cultures have used uh, insects as a traditional food. Yeah from the nutrient content, it looks pretty good. Uh, the reality is, of course, we don't have any long-term studies that we'd really like to have, but uh, in the meantime, I, th we, uh, I think uh, integrating some of these into our food systems is a uh, useful to proceed, way to proceed, uh, but we should study them as we uh, go through this process. They can, uh, insects can also have some intermediate role, too, taking uh, foods that are high in cellulose that we can't digest and converting that food to something that chickens or fish can eat. And so there's some interesting loops we can put into the cycle there where insects could play an important role. Mm -hmm. David, you want anything to add? Well, the last time I saw Walter in person, um, cricket bread was served. Um, mm. And I tried it. Um, you know, I, I think the, the bridge there, if people, say you like that. Uh, mm, mm, mm. there was no so jam and butter, but jam and butter. <laughs> and, mm. You know, I think the ick factor for some people, you can jump over that by reminding sort of all of us, particularly those of us that live in New England, and there's a slight tick problem here, that animals, many animals that we eat, eat insects. So maybe we flip this thing on its head where we're growing food to feed animals things traditionally they didn't eat for a millennia many millennia, and we remind each other that, in fact, crickets and insects are great sources of food for the animals that we may, may then well consume. So I think there's a really interesting sort of construct we could flip pretty quickly back to what was once normal. And we decided, I don't know why culturally, was not normal. So, um, David, I think probably that's where I'd go with that first. Jam and bread. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts and broccoli. Donuts and, and broccoli. Yeah, okay. Ants <laughs> before, <ants laughs> yeah. before crickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, a couple more questions. So um, I wonder if um, someone's asking about organic, which is men mentioned here before, and one of the things that's often said is that, well, we really can't grow enough food organically to feed the world. Can we achieve, the question is from a viewer in Washington, D.C., can we achieve feeding the world's population with organic produ production principles? Um, you want to take that? Or well, we, yeah, we did look at this in our report. Uh, our commission report where we had agricultural experts there. And uh, 
I, I think with uh, today we would probably not be able to feed the world with 100% organic, mm -hmm. but I really applaud and encourage every effort to produce food in a more organic way. It's mm -hmm. not just a yes no answer, uh, but uh, reducing our insecticides, herbicides, agricultural chemicals uh, is very possible by employing uh, organic principles. I, I think the biggest, one of the biggest constraints is having enough nitrogen fertilizer for parts of Africa where uh, yields are extremely low. Uh, the long-term solution will involve some organic practices, but uh, in the interim, at least maybe in the long run, some modest amounts of non-organic fertilizer probably will be uh, uh, required. So again, uh, trying to move in that direction as much as we can uh, is highly desirable. Uh, and we should learn from that. Uh, but just a quick uh, switch to 100% organic today is probably not feasible. So one, one more question uh, from my iPad here, and then we'll go to uh, the uh, audience here. Um, do the panel, well, actually, this is, Gina, this is for a question for you, because you were talking beforehand about uh, some people who are using, converting lawns and tilling lawns and growing crops mm -hmm. where there once was a lawn. So someone is saying, uh, do, the, do, um, do the panel see some of the farming production reverting to homegrown gardens uh, and gardeners similar to Victory Gardens during World War II. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes, so, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things I mentioned before we came on was that uh, there was a young man who I met during the climate summit in California. I was in line getting coffee, and he tapped me on the shoulder. And, and he said, hey, I do this really cool thing. And he basically deals with young people, and he, I think he calls it farms for bikes or something and he is he is they go around and they go in in cities and they they sign people up to be able to use their front lawn to grow food and the people get to really use the food as much as they want and they harvest it when it's ready and they sell the what they harvest and it provides a you know a, a little good economic job for for a lot of young people only it provides awesome opportunities for fresh food for those families mm -hmm. now you have to be careful in the city that you that the soil is good and it's it's clean enough to 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 not sort of sneak other things into your food mm -hmm. as it grows mm -hmm. but it, it, it's just there's so much we could do to be more creative. And to me, anything you can do to personalize these issues, make people have the power over these, these things, the better or not they're gonna demand that they, ha they have uh, really strong, naturally you know, uh, uh, produced uh, products that they'll be comfortable with. And, and I, I think it's great. Uh, it, everyone can get involved in these types of issues. Okay, thank you. So let's, uh, does anyone have a question here in the audience? Yes, right here in the front. I think get, get a microphone to you. Hi, I'm Lillian Chang from the Department of Nutrition. And I want to quote from a recent study, or not study, as a viewpoint from my colleagues in the Friedman School of Nutrition and Policy, Science and Policy uh, that was published in JAMA. Um, and at Tufts University there. The farm bill remains a powerful but underutilized tool for promoting public health, reducing healthcare spending, and improving disparities. And much more should be done to fully leverage this potential. Right now, in the 2018 allocation, we're talking about 86 billion uh, allocation annually. And for the CDC, it's only five billion a year, and uh, National Institute of Health, thirty-seven billion a year. And oh, sorry, I <laughs> so, and also, what's interesting is that half the recipients of the farm bill um, are either uh, with uh, getting Medicaid or Medicare, so they are not in good health. And in terms of the recipients from the farming perspective, it's still a crop insurance for corn, wheat, soy, and cotton. We are trying to get the public to eat more fruits and vegetables, right? But it's far from serving it, that amount. And we are the farm bill is talking about affecting 70 million acres of farmland. So I would like to ask the panel, how can we mobilize the public or what other measures that, you know, actions we can do to move the needle in the farm bill. Thank you. 
Could I just say, I did, I actually read that article in one of the, uh, who knew I read JAMA? I <laughs> <laughs> must have been a clip somewhere, right? Um, I, I, um, uh, one of the other fascinating things is how much of the, the money that's invested through the farm bill actually goes just to the top 17 percent of the largest farms. Mm -hmm. So the, there is there is a there is a challenge here, and and I think one of the the interesting things when you're in government and you're trying to influence the, the how markets move um, to make sure that they protect people's health is what I did. But is there's two ways to do it? You can regulate it or you can incent it. The farm bill is the biggest one of the biggest tools we have in the United States of America to incent good public health, but it is generally not rethought every year with that in mind. And this is, this is one area where it's not about Democrats versus Republicans. It is everybody's all in for agriculture, but they do the same thing with the Farm Bill year in and year out. That ought to be rethought. So what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone else want to add something? We're going to move on to uh, look at the end here. Walter? Did you want to say something? Well, uh, just to add, uh, there's not a simple answer to this, and we are up against very powerful lobbies here. But we uh, do have to look at it uh, in, through the lens of health and environment. Uh, that's not the usual lens that it's looked at through now. It's uh, political interests uh, and uh, p uh, powerful industries. Uh, but we also really do want to have another goal is uh, 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 sustainable incomes for farmers who are really trying to do the right thing, yeah. uh, and it's not yeah. easy. They're uh, uh, they're going bankrupt uh, even even today in mm -hmm. large numbers. Well, can you just talk briefly about that, about the economic ad you know aspect of this or impact on farmers and, and agricultural mm -hmm. industry or in general? Well, I'm not an expert in that area. I really am looking at food, but uh, I did grow up in a farming area and, and a, fa a long-term farming family in Michigan, and so I I do know firsthand that. Uh, it, it, there's been a huge aggregation, and the economics uh, incentives, are th the way they are today, are pushing people toward these mega farms. Uh, smaller, medium-sized farms are having a very hard, hard time making it. Uh, now, some people say that we shouldn't have any government intervention, but we clearly are intervening mm -hmm. uh, already, and it's just intervening in a way that is not supporting health or sustainability or the incomes in communities in, in rural America. So uh, we really do need to um, work with others uh, organizing. This is a political issue to a large extent, yeah. not a scientific issue. So uh, we're going to wrap. Before we wrap up, I just want to ask each of you to give kind of a, a brief takeaway message. So why don't you just continue and we'll move on down. What's the takeaway that everyone should leave with? Uh, very briefly, there is a big triple win here for adopting diets that are both healthy for us and that are sustainable and that are enjoyable. That's my bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. What Gina? he said, uh, plus I do think there's a market for a broccoli donut. I just don't <laughs> know who's going to produce it. Wow. Or a cricket donut. <laughs> That's extra. That's a little bit more. Broccoli donut with a cricket chaser. <laughs> um, I would just end with what I started with. Thank you. And um, for those of you in the room that are much younger than me, sometimes I get asked, you know, how I got started on my career in sustainability. If you look in my rearview mirror, it looks obvious, <coughs> but it's not. I think you just have to be curious. And when people ask me, they're typically students like some of you who want to do this sort of work. And the first thing I say is thank you. So I would ask you, go find a hundred of your friends and bring them on because we absolutely need you. We're trying our best to maybe correct some of the sins of the past, but it's going to take all of us and generations to come to really get this right. So go find a friend, better yet, find dozens mm -hmm. and convince them to come over and do this work with us. Mm -hmm. And Anna? Yeah, and for me, it always comes down to the connection, um, as I spoke about earlier. Um, and I feel like we're all connected in our own in our own ways, and everything, every choice we make has uh, makes a difference. And um, you know, if you're just not thinking about it, and if it's just food that's going to get you through the next couple hours, or is it real? Is there what's the story behind this? It starts becoming a little bit more interesting. Um, and I do think. Um, you know, even just if you're, if, I mean, nobody, not everybody has time or space to grow their own food, but even if you don't, to try to make a connection with someone that does, 
um, improves our, our health all around. Um, I, I just think the connection and the stories and the people are a big piece of it too. Okay, I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks to all of the panelists here. Thank all of you. Thanks to our audience uh, here in the studio and also online. And before we leave, I'd like to ask, uh, encourage, I've been asked to encourage all of you to tune into the next forum, which is entitled High U.S. Healthcare Costs, What Might Be Done? That's on April the 4th from noon to 1, and more details at forumhsph.org. So thanks, everybody. Thanks.